Welcome to the St. Martin Anti-Poverty Platform and the St. Martin Consumers Coalition Press Conference of today, Thursday, February the 6th, 2020. We have four topics for you. First one, 62% of the World Bank grant disbursed for emergency income support and training project. Topic number two, 98% of the persons enrolled in the Emergency Income Support and Training Project. Topic number three, 1,766 stipends disbursed for students of the Emergency Income Support and Training Pro Project. Topic number four, who is financing the medical coverage of the students in the Emergency Income Support and Training courses? Let's start with the first one. 62% of the World Bank grant was disbursed for the Emergency Income Support and Training Project. As you know, the Emergency Income Support and Training Project provides unemployed and underemployed workers the opportunity to partake in a six-month training and certification program in the hospitality and the construction sectors. The World Bank wrote in the project plan that the social and economic effects of Hurricane Irma and the disasters impact on poverty levels could be significant if action is not immediately taken. So, in the absence of a national poverty line for St. Martin, the United Nations Development Program benchmark for poverty is based on a minimum wage developed in 2015, this benchmark indicates that 27% of the households in St. Martin, which is approximately 3,762 households, are poor, and that they live on a revenue at or below the minimum wage, which is 1,530 guilders, or approximately 850 US dollars a month according to the figures of 2017 that the World Bank has provided. The benchmark for poverty of the households in 2014, developed by the Dutch Nibut Institute in the Dutch Caribbean islands of Bonaire, was 75% in 2011 and 94% in 2015 for St. Martin. This benchmark was based on a combined household income of less than 4,000 guilders or 2,222 US dollars a month. This was 13,000 households. So based on international experience, the World Bank wrote that the poorest and the most vulnerable groups are likely disproportionately affected by the disaster including St. Martin's large number of female-headed households. And they provided a figure of 38.7% of all the households that are female-headed. So a lot of families, depending on the income of women, post-hurricane. So that was the reasoning for the Emergency Income Support and Training Project that started in 2018. It had to provide temporary income support for those families, the so-called stipend of a thousand guilders a month, and it had to improve the employability of the affected workers, especially targeting two sectors, the construction sector and the hospitality sector. An amount of 20 million US dollars was targeted and set aside for this program. According to the progress report of the World Bank of December last year, the project has made substantial progress. The project has disbursed 14 million US dollars, which represents 62% of the total grant and the proceeds. That's the first way of the World Bank to measure the success of the program. They targeted 
over 20 million dollars they have already spent 14 thousand dollars uh, 14 million dollars so they say that they have already achieved quite some of the objective of the program we go now to topic number two which is not dealing with the amount of money that we have to spend but which has to go and deal with how many persons have benefited from the program how many persons have benefited since August 2018 according to the World Bank the progress report of December last year said that the total enrolled was 1766 participants which is almost the target that they had in the plan of 1800 beneficiaries some characteristics of the student population in the income support and training project were that three out of four students was unemployed 73 percent that two out of three students were women 67 percent that one out of the four students was youth 24 percent and that two out of four unemployed persons in the country which is half of the unemployed based on the 2018 labor force survey benefited from this project and one out of four students they said which is 25 percent has returned to their previous jobs the progress report made mention that others have found jobs or that they have remained in the program to continue training but no figures were mentioned for these categories of students we have calculated how much students have graduated so far and we came to a total of 1206 students which is two out of the three students in the course 68 percent according to the progress report as per December 2019 958 students which is 72 percent graduated from the 1331 enrolled and that were verified by the Stifting Overheads Accountants Bureau the Government Accounting Bureau the report mentioned that the next cohort of participants are expected to graduate in the first quarter of 2020 well in the Daily Herald of yesterday we could read that on Friday last week another 248 students received their certificates from the six-month hospitality and culinary courses given by the St. Martin Training Foundation this brings the total graduates as we calculated to 1206 students in addition to the hospitality and the culinary certificates 107 students earned the coveted American Hotel and Lodging Educational Institute customer service gold certification and 91 culinary students received the hazard analysis and critical control point food handler certificates this latter certificate is a legal requirement for all persons that are working in the culinary industry in Samantha. The question is, how many of these graduates found a job? Because one of the objectives of the emergency income and training program was to increase the employability. So we want to know how many graduates got employment. As mentioned before, one out of four students which is 25 percent has returned to their previous jobs according to the world bank progress report so which means that until now only 442 persons of the 1766 students got employment only when we know how many of these students got a job we can say if the project was a success in terms of employability so let's go to topic number three the 1766 stipends disbursed 
for students of the training courses. The emergency income support and the training project that started in August 2018 had as objective to provide temporary income support to the students and their family. This was the so-called stipend of a thousand guilders a month. A total of 20.6 million US dollars was earmarked for this part of the project. According to the progress report of the World Bank of December 2019, the project has dispersed 14.1 million US dollars, representing 62% of the total grant proceeds. Now, who introduced this 1,000 guilder stipend norm? Before the emergency income training project was implemented here by the World Bank, NRPB, and the Samaritan Training Foundation, there was a pilot skills and training program which started by businesses in the tourism sector and which focused on the hospitality industry. In December 2017, a group of hotels created the St. Martin Training Foundation and later with a government subsidy, they started the skills and training program. The stipend of 1,000 guilders a month was between 40 and 50 percent of the pre-hurricane wages to the idle workers. And so, the project supported the objectives of St. Martin's NRRP, which is the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, to restore economic, community, and governance infrastructure and the service delivery. That's according to the World Bank. The project is aligned with the World Bank's twin goals of ending poverty and boosting shared prosperity by supporting populations affected by the hurricane and contributing to strengthening future resilience to underpin sustainability and inclusive growth. Very nice wording, very nice terms, but what does it mean? Did the stipends end the poverty? If the goal of the World Bank is to end poverty of those affected by the hurricane, the question is, does a stipend of a thousand guilders or 555 US dollars a month take a person or a household out of poverty? The government of St. Martin, as well as the UNDP, maintain that based on the minimum wage stipulated in St. Martin, only persons and households with less than the minimum wage of over 1,500 guilders are to be defined as being in poverty. But Transparency International, though based on the Nibut research done in Bonaire, define all persons and households with a combined income of 4,000 guilders or 2,222 US dollars a month as being in poverty. With the cost of living in St. Martin being higher than in Bonaire, what a household need not to be in poverty in St. Martin, in other words, is much more than the 4,000 guilders a month. So what about considering for the households in St. Martin the same minimum household income as in the other part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the European part, the Netherlands? There, in the Netherlands, are two poverty definitions. The first one is from the Social Cultural Plan Bureau. They define poverty as having less than enough money to provide for basic living needs and to participate in society. What is the amount needed to do so? The Social Cultural Plan Bureau of the Netherlands says around 1,135 euro for a single person and 2,200 euro for a family with two children in 2017. The National Statistics Office, the Central Bureau of Statistics in the Netherlands, uses a different definition of poverty. 
the Central Bureau of Statistics says that single people with an income of no more than 1,040 euro a month and families with children on an income of 1,960 euro a month, they risk poverty. Now with the cost of living here in St. Martin being much higher than in Bonaire or in the Netherlands, based on the central Cult, the Social Cultural Plan Bureau definition, not to be in poverty, a single person here should get at least 1,249 US dollars or 2,248 guilders. So a family with two children should get at least 2,420 US dollars or 4,356 Antillian guilders. In other words, these amounts, they still have to be adjusted to the cost of living here in St. Martin because this is according to the cost of living in the Netherlands. And then we come to the conclusion that we have unequal social protection for the people in St. Martin in this part of the kingdom. Based on Article 9, the right to social security, and Article 11, the right to an adequate standard of living, both in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and according to Article 2 of the same covenant, which is the non-discrimination article, all citizens in the kingdom, and so also those here in St. Martin, are entitled to the same social protection, not to be in poverty. In other words, the thousand guilders stipend, the social allowances up to 70% of the minimum wage in St. Martin, as well as the maximum social pensions of, a of 1,100 guilders, are all poverty income, and they do not take the people out of poverty. That is why as anti-poverty platform, we claim equal human rights in the kingdom. Our last topic is topic number four. Who is financing the medical coverage of the students in the emergency income support and training courses? The World Bank project plan informed that the project would be implemented by the St. Martin Training Foundation, a private not-for-profit institution. And in a letter to the students, the St. Martin Training Foundation informed them that the foundation will pay a monthly stipend that will also cover transportation costs. And additionally, beneficiaries will receive health insurance benefits while in the program. This health insurance benefit was based on an instruction of the Ministry of Public Health, Social Development and Labor, Ministry of VSR, which was issued on May the 30th, 2018. It was an instruction to the Health and Social Insurance Fund, SFV. VSA, we read in the plan, has the mandate to instruct SFV to take specific actions as instructed within the law. And what they mean with instruction, as a legal term which refers to the written request issued by VSA to SFV for compliance. Well, as all the students which are unemployed or underemployed workers working less than 20 hours for them to qualify to come into the course, based on which law? And based on which articles of which social and health insurance law the students administered by the St. Martin Training Foundation had to pay premium for their ZV medical card? In which healthcare fund these students were administered by ZV? Who is paying the premium for the healthcare coverage? of these students. We ask this because 
the St. Martin Training Foundation is not an employer of the students. And the students are not an employee of the St. Martin Training Foundation. So who is paying the medical expenses incurred by these students? Are these premiums and medical expenses of the students administered in the ZV fund, which is this Workers' Sickness Insurance Fund? Or are they administered separately in the OZR, which is the Government Sickness Arrangement, for PP card holders? Because it cannot be in the one for the civil servants. So we ask these questions because we have already protested the unlawful depletion of the ZV funds in former press conferences. Let it be very clear, we are not against medical expenses being covered and administered by SFV. Because based on Article 12, the right to health of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, everyone has the right to access affordable, highest attainable level of health care. So we have explained the management of SRV in our meetings that we had with them that just as the civil servants premiums and their medical expenses just as the PP card holders their medical expenses they are administered separately the seniors with a Z fee 62 plus card also have to be administered separately and not in the Z fee fund. Because that is not in the law. Who is paying the medical cost of these students now? The workers in their family sickness insurance fund? The Z fee fund? Or is it the government? Like government is paying for the PP card holders. Or is it the World Bank on behalf of the Dutch Trust Fund? SRV has already been addressed by SOAB, the Government Accountants Bureau, and by the St. Martin Consumers Coalition, that it is unlawful to administer persons in the sickness insurance funds of the workers, the ZV fund, who are not full-time employed workers or who are not recently retired up to a maximum of one year after retirement. These students are unemployed or underemployed working less than 20 hours a week. So just as other workers who are not full-time employed, they cannot get a ZV card. And we have examples of workers that complain that they cannot get a doctor card because they're working part-time, less than 40 hours a week. These students, in other words, cannot be administered in the ZV fund. They have to be administered separately. So we are looking forward to the meeting with SFV management and with the Council of Ministers on our concerns regarding the deficits and the administration errors that we have observed with the health insurance funds at SFV. Are there any questions to clarify? I have one question. You say that students are receiving a stipend of a thousand euros. That's during the course, during that time in the course. Per month. A thousand euros per month. How long is the course? Six it's six months. As long as this is ongoing, this is what they have, what they get. And we got this information from the letters that they got from the St. Martin Training Foundation. But also, we have indication that this is what is going on based on what the World Bank is reporting and what they had already in their plan and how they copied that from the initial program that was there before the World Bank started to fund this emergency pro project. Yeah, that was the skills training program. 
So this was something that the um, hotels that started it mm -hmm. and government agreed upon. They're going to pay the workers a stipend because they were not working any longer full time. They were reducing the hours. And so this was apparently the idea to complement the fact that you are not getting any more a full salary. With the stipend, you have to go to classes. If you follow the classes, you get the money. If you're not, if you're missing out without a valid reason, then there was no payout. And in the report, was it little mentioned about once they graduate, there's something to help them transition into the workforce? Okay, we read in uh, one of the reports from December that they suggested that there would be support for the students to get them employed by taking them to employers and uh, recommending them based on the fact that they have been certified. Yeah. We remember that when the, the youngsters, the people that were trained to go in construction, the minister at that time was very uh, very happy to say that all got the job. The thing that we are looking at is employability, promoting that wonderfully. You got the money, you invested in that, wonderful. But what about the jobs? Did they get the jobs? Because just as you know that people, because of age, they are sometimes being refused to get a job. They prefer a younger one because then they have to pay less. Just as you know that they tell you sometimes you are overqualified. There are a lot of things happening in our labor market that was not covered by the project. The project didn't study what are the mechanisms in the labor market that is actually keeping a lot of people out of the job. Yes, there are people that is getting a job. But why is it that St. Martin for so long, and this is also in the report, has been employing so many unskilled people? Why it is now that the hurricane struck that the hotel sector is saying, I want to give you skills training. On the job training, in any company where you come to work, if they want to give you that, that's good. They can do that. That happened with Mullet Bay. People got training on the job. And that was not stipend, that was not paid. You're working and you get additional training. Now we see here an initiative that came out of the hotel sector that they wanted to make people more employable. They even gave opportunity to people that was not working with them. Just to get more people to choose and pick and choose among them. And we already have indications that there are students right now already that have been or are that preparing to be graduated that are already being picked out by some of the companies, by some of the trainers that come out of these hotels to work with them. And so you see already how they are shifting between the ones that is coming in the courses and all of that. So employability is not only giving you skills training, it is also what does the company want from you, how they look at you. And that part has not been addressed by the program, but that's a very important thing to evaluate the success of the program. So we will be following this aspect as we see here a human rights uh, precedence. For instance, there are students going to the NIPA. They don't go for the certificate. They go for the diploma. And they don't get in a thousand guilders stipend. You get a message? And we got complaints from students in those programs already. Why don't we get that? So you can get help from outside. And the Dutch Trust Fund can be there and providing some, let's say, support and actually a new norm. For you to become employable, we will train you 
you can get a certificate. Now, if you want a diploma, for instance, at NEPA, are you also getting the same benefit? Do you also get your medical coverage covered? So, you see here, transportation to go NEPA, can you get that also in the stipend that it is being paid for? Now, the St. Martin Training Foundation is not the NEPA foundation. Different, right? But still the question is, if the St. Martin Training Foundation could get all these benefits to provide to the students, and mind you, we support it, eh? we are not against it, we, we, we think it's a very good initiative to assist people for them not to be in poverty at the same time making them employable, very good. What about all the others that also want to become employable? At the NEPA, for instance, in the courses. When will they get the same benefits? So we look at this from double perspective. What is the effect? How positive the program is in terms of the objectives that was there? Now, we see already that the objective of to come out of poverty, as long as the minimum wages, as long as the um, stipends are not equal or even better than in the Netherlands, it is still poverty, keeping them in poverty, because cost of living here higher than in the Netherlands. So we look at this thing very critical from the perspective of what are we doing to eradicate the poverty. Giving people more employability for them to get a job, yes, you can get an income out of the job, but if the income is still not sufficient for the household, then you have kept them in poverty. And that is what we see with minimum wage for sure. And if you look at what it should be for a household, how much US dollars, how much guilders, then you see that until now, our minimum wage is a poverty wage. And so when you look at uh, what people are getting as income, as they are unemployed, it's even less. So if we really want to address poverty, to get the people out of poverty, we still maintain that the 4,000 guilders is not enough. It should be higher. Look at the Netherlands, it is already higher there. And so with that said, it is very necessary that we do the research here of what is needed exactly for you not to be in poverty. And we can refer there to the minimum reference budget proposal, research proposal that the USM will be doing together with the anti-poverty platform and the NIBUT as soon as the financing for this research project can be arranged. How is the situation going with um, the Lois Richardson? She's got to show to get a home that we repair. We could give us an update on that. The situation of uh, this lady is that uh, we accompanied her to um, lawyer, legal advisor, Cormaps, consumer lawyer, and uh, he decided to uh, take over the case as. Uh, the lady has been complaining with the NRPB so long about the quality of the construction work that was being delivered and uh, even the, uh, the NRPB based on that has recognized that there is still a lot to be done and so um, with uh, the legal advisor now uh, steps are being taken to get from NRPB accountability. Now this is one example, there are some others after our press conference came up and indicated to us their dissatisfaction with um, their relationship with the NRPB as one. And there are others that say, my house has still not been rebuilt, I'm still waiting. And so with all these complaints, we said, we pass them on to our legal advisor because we want to bring government and the kingdom government to court. 
because we don't think that it is fair that where in the Netherlands 62,000 homes, new homes, have been built. The same year that Irma struck, and you can't build the 15,000 that you have in the National Recovery Resilience Plan report as damaged, structurally damaged. 15,000 is less than 60,000. So if you can do 60,000 in one year, that building capacity, you can share that with us here. And so that we can get the 15,000 homes because next hurricane season is coming up again. And this is already the third year after hurricane. Do you think that um, if you go to court that the problem will get solved? So in terms of who is liable, um, this is a legal battle because the NRPB wants, of course, the contractor to be liable. Is they contracted this contractor. And they gave this contractor a batch of homes and uh, more complaints because of their choice for the contractor. It is not the consumer that chose the contractor. It's the NRPB that chose the contractor. So the consumer is of the opinion and we support that opinion. It is the NRPB that is responsible for the promise to deliver home repair of acceptable quality because as they put in their flyers the building back better principle. As they put it. So do it. And that is where we are at the moment. We think that this will become a test case and more of these cases will come up because at the end of the day, quality has to be provided for the building back better principle. So we don't look primarily to the workers. We look primarily to who had it, the project, who uh, employed, uh, who was giving the instructions, who was guiding the workers. Yeah, Because that is the one that's responsible to give the quality of the work. Good? You're welcome. We invite you for the next week. Same hour, same time.